just finished my second year. Um, my main interests are by the deep sea and vertebrates in specific and larvae and the eco ecology that surrounds them. Mainly kind of the way that organisms interact with their habitat as it were, specifically instead of just concentrating on a singular organism. I'm much more interested in kind of um, uh, ecological implications of the system in the deep sea and stuff like that. So my place in the structure here, well, what's going on is I'm currently working with deep sea crew and Dr. Mary Powell to do with uh, mapping the deep projects and sponges in the Faroe Shetland Channel. And then later on to do with, uh, later on next year, I'll be going hopefully to Scandinavia to do some other external work, probably on Marby. In terms of the Mapping the Deep project, it's a project run by the Deep Sea Crew, so Nels, Banks, and Barry, and they look into uh, mapping large areas of the Deep Sea using multi-beam and bathymetry maps in order to give a better understanding of the different biotypes and ecological niches found within the deep ocean. So we went, and I was very lucky, and I got to go on a cruise, for two weeks in July, and we went from Galway, an island, up to north on the Hackerockle Bank, and then down onto the Falkland Sea Bight and back into uh, Gimble in Ireland. So that's pretty cool. Uh, my own work that I'm working on at the moment is I'm looking into the association between deep sea sponges and yeah, um, internal tide mechanisms, tidal wave mechanisms, sorry. So um, I'll get more into that later, but that's what I'm doing as my own specific research, as it were. Um, Okay, um, so Map of Deep is about raw habitat mapping. It's producing maps of the deep ocean so that we've got a, not only a better understanding of what's down there, but so that we have better uh, evidence to give to like policymakers and stuff so that we can begin to protect our vulnerable marine environments. So that was the crew, well, the scientists on the ship that I was on, um, called Gareth, Brent, and me, and Mills, Will, and Matt, I don't know why. Um, so there are two models that we were testing, well, there's more than two models, but the two vulnerable marine um, habitats that we were mainly looking at was reef-forming corals, is the first one. So they're expansive, massive coral reefs that are up to uh, like a kilometre down in the ocean, and mainly around kind of a 500, 600-meter mark. And I've got a video of them. So this one was taken at... I believe 660 meters down. So you can see like the reef forming corals are these ones and these ones. And the species is Ophelia Pertusa, and then you've got Magapora, which is another type. And then if you go deeper down into um, kind of like the continental shelf, you get another species called Solena Simulacrona, which is quite funny. So this is the kind of stuff that we were seeing when we went to the reef habitats. It was, it was pretty incredible. I mean, most people don't expect there to be this kind of level of diversity within the reefs. And then we set an ROV down there and you come across stuff like this. Um, it's, it's this huge 3D habitat. It, it massive off the ground, like you can see tons of informal with it. So specifically, there's lots of like, um, lots of other types of coral, the darians. There was tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of hydrodermes. So stuff like Sideris, so the one on the case there. And then, um, Lots of asteroids, so it was, it was just really, really cool. I mean, it's just you can see how kind of like three D the structures are because they grow up in obviously because it's not light dependent. I expect, like, I don't actually know myself, but I expect I'll be growing up into areas of the water column where there's more sediment coming through. So you end up with like channels and big aggregations in one place surrounded by nothing. So it's it's really cool. It's just it's not the homogeneous environment that a lot of people expect the deep sea to look like, as it were. And the other main habitat that we were focusing on on the cruise was sponge aggregation. <coughs> so in the deep sea, uh, about a thousand meters down, if not like, deeper, you get huge great big aggregations of a sponge called Pharyngeum carpentary, which is the bird's nest sponge. It's a hexag sponge, it's a glass sponge, and it's incredibly good in that it has a lot of informal associated with it. So it's got a lot of associate organisms. And when the um, actual sponge is on the seabed, it sheds its spicules, so, um, Kind of like if in the case there, there's some spicules from a different glass sponge, but they're essentially like long threads, and it comes out of it and makes this mat around the bottom, which actually changes the composition of the sediment itself. So the environment that you're in is not only being kind of changed by the fact that the sponge is there, but the very sediment and the very composition of the ground that we're on, or the substrate that they're on, is being changed by the presence of the sponges. And when I when like you say aggregation, I mean aggregation, like. There are thousands of them. There are fields of these sponges. They're absolutely incredible to look. Like you'd expect, okay, maybe one or two here, but no, it's it's literal hundreds. The density is enormous. Like this is just one of the ones that you saw. 
You've got, again, under the kind of terms, and if you actually look inside the sponges, they are covered in ophiroids. On the inside, you get stuff like, like little squat lobsters and shrimps, and it's, it was just incredible, like having an ROV go over this. And it's like this for hours at a time. It's, it's just to total coverage of sponges. I mean, if you look around the box of them, it'll be a clearer picture later on, but around the box of them, they appear to be like little mounds, kind of, a little sticking up into the water column a little bit more. The mound beneath them is almost entirely spicules, and if you look at the composition of it on images and stuff, you can actually see how kind of, how different it is to the sediment around it, specifically underneath the sponges, which makes a massive difference to the type of fauna that may be able to live there, because obviously it's completely different to the surrounding area. So, I mean, they're, they're really, really cool. Like, I mean, they're, they're just, they're, I haven't seen anything like this before. And I mean, when I was told sponge aggregation, I was expecting, okay, two or three, but it's not two or three sponges. <laughs> I think that's a stop. So the two main hypotheses that Cruz was kind of drafted to look into, at, well, this is the, the group's work, not mine, as it were, was they were looking at predictive mod um, predictively modeled habitat maps based on terrain direct derived variables produ produce provides an accurate reflection of the distribution of benefit percentages considered. So it was the idea that the maps that were basically predicting the area would predict them successfully. That's kind of basically what it was. I think exactly I mean, that was what we were testing. Really. And then the other one was using high resolution multi beam bathometric data to perform significantly better than those constructed using coarser resolution jet bathometry data. For each of the two habitats, there were two models that were run, coarse and um, high resolution data. One, I believe, was um, one was 750 meter uh, interval points, so you have a much coarser representation of the bathymetry, and one was at 250 meter points. So it reflects a lot more accurately kind of what the bottom of the seafloor looks like. And it, it was it, uh, what the main test for that hypothesis was, was looking at which one of these accurately reflects the habitats that they're trying to map. So trying to find errors within the mapping so that we can start to use it as a tool to kind of um, accurately and consistently reflect what we think is there, as opposed to just kind of going, we think that this is here, it may or may not be there, there's this much chance, it needs to be a lot more concrete so that, we can, so that it can be used for policy or kind of just knowing where these things are and accurately knowing where they are instead of just kind of guesswork. So results of the cruise were, the two main points from the cruise were that the Ophelia model 100% successfully predicted the presence or absence of the reefs. I mean, as it is, the, the reefs themselves, on bathymetry maps, you can look at the high rays and you can see where the reefs are. Because they build these gigantic coral maps, like they can be hundreds of feet high. So you're looking at bathymetry and it's flat and then just kind of a coral map. So it, it's pretty good at predicting it. We found that the high rays is more successful and that's thought mainly from speculation from other authors that the, the high-res data obviously will reflect the kind of the small-scale changes in the bathymetry where the reefs themselves are. So for example, you'll get, um, if you have a 250 meter grid square compared to a 700 meter, 750 meter grid square, you could have like, it all averaged to a very thin layer and it's just, okay, whereas the 250, you could have thin, higher, and then thin again, which much more accurately represents the map. So it's like, there's the coral. So whilst they both accurately pre predict whether there's presence or absence, the high resolution gives a much accurate, more accurate representation of the actual area of the reefs themselves. In terms of the Theronema models, there was only 60% success for presence. So it, and the low res was much more successful, which is interesting because whilst we don't know, the speculation there is that the, as opposed to the corals where you can detect where they are based on the fact that you can see the coral themselves, the sponge aggregations are thought to have, uh, they're thought to, uh, the, the presence of them is thought to be driven much more by kind of like broad scale bathymetric features. So by taking into account the much broader scale and the wider range of things that's going on in the area, you can more accurately predict where they are as it were, as opposed to focusing much more on the fine detail because, well, if you focus more on the fine detail, you're missing out the broad scale drivers that we think could possibly drive the um, abundance of the sponges. So we, with the uh, two, main results, we found four new coral reefs, which are pretty cool, like never seen before by people didn't know that they were there. And the Ferronema model, we reconfirmed that there are Ferronema in the Portugal Sea White, which is pretty well known, but it's a lot of papers on that. 
The second trays where we collected samples of ferronema and other structural sponges, such as hyalinella, which is the bottom one there, which is what those spicules are from. And they were mainly used for, uh, they're mainly used for, um, the, that's a bit of a, they're used for population genetics. So um, they took individuals and then we took tissue samples in order to work on the population genetics and kind of what's going on in each of the population of the sponges. We also took samples for um, biodiscovery analysis. So setting it off to see what different compounds are within the sponges to see if there's any kind of medicinal use for them, which would be pretty good in one way and in another than not, arguably. But um, yeah, and then we sent them off to a sponge taxonomist. So the production of images from the cruise data and stuff to match up with the sponge samples sent off for identification. And something, one of the coolest things, in my opinion, that we did on the cruise was something that was de developed by Bex and Nils, which was the use, mainly Nils, though. Like, okay, <laughs> mainly Nils. And it was the use of fluorescein dye to measure the um, active pumping rates of sponges in the deep sea. It's been shown in many, 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 many sh shallow water species. There's you know, images all over YouTube and everywhere, but this is the first time we've done it in the deep sea successfully. And it was pretty damn awesome. That was awesome. And I have a video of Oliveferonema close. So that's the uh, the hose with the fluorescein running through it. Um, it's it's kind of free flow. So there was a box, and then the pressure can be put in the box to force it out. But other than that, the fluorescein is just kind of flowing through for it. So the sponge takes the fluorescein in through the sides of the body, and then pushes it out through the middle the um, middle exhalant siphon known as mosculum. So essentially what it's doing is it's pulling all the water and all the sediment through its body in order to filter it and feed, because it's a, it's a filter feeding organism. And then the rest of it comes out the osculum. But this is the first time that we showed the uptake through the sponge body and out of the osculum in a deep sea species. So it was, it was pretty impressive. We did it with a fair few sponges and we sort of a couple of attempts to work, but that was awesome. I mean, on top of the Faronema ones, because that was obviously the one we were aiming to test, we also managed to do it with a different species of sponge, the other kind of structural one. This was when we were putting pressure on the fluorescein, so it was a little bit more kind of aggressive in terms of the application. And yeah, it kind of got smothered a bit. Please stop, please stop. So the, the fluorescein <laughs> is harmless for the environment. Yeah, it's way. completely safe. It's, used as, it's the same kind, it's the same dye that they use in um, like uh, angiograms and hearts and stuff to measure blood flow in humans, so it's non-toxic. It's, it's bright and it's, a, it's, it's a real eyesore. I mean, I mean, there's these big streaks, but I mean, it's in the deep sea, you can't see it. So. And this was incredibly cool because we watched it and then just ever so slowly, you can start to see the fluorescein dye come out of the um, muscular on the top of the sponge. What's interesting is that, like, from personal observation, I don't know if there was a fact or anything, but um, deep sea sponges have been shown to have a lot slower pumping rates than shallow water species, as much as it was not a specific type, not these ones, not the glass ones, but another deep sea sponge, Geodia has been shown to have pumping rates four times lower than the shallow water species. So that's probably why it's coming out so slowly out of the sponge itself. But it is active. It's not just kind of flowing into the sponge and then out the other end passively. It's definitely active on it. That's pretty awesome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it just kind of goes on. Uh, what do you speak about? So like, my role on the cruise itself is this wasn't objectively my work, it was the work of the group. What I, my participation towards it was, I did a lot of data archiving in terms of ROV footage, kind of putting it to the computer, uh, video analysis. So post-cruise, all of the images that were taken of the organisms for the um, sponge taxonomist, I found the in-situ and ex-situ images in order to match them up and send them off. Um, I produced all of, like, most of the media that's come out about it, so kind of like, the, the particular image, no, not images, the video footage that was cut from the massive graphic ROV footage and then publicized more on public outreach. So trying to get people more aware of what was going on by posting a lot of stuff on social media sites, talking to people in person, like just trying to promote the, 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 the cruise itself and the discoveries that we found. Because the deep sea, most people have this kind of idea that it's this homogenous, boring environment, it's flat and maybe got some worms in it, which just is not true by any extent of the imagination. But getting that across to people is quite difficult unless you have, for example, ridiculously good footage of coral reefs or fire. <laughs> so, that's quite funny. In terms of the wider applications for this research, we've got a lot more evidence now to support the use of predictive habitat modeling as kind of something that can be used to put forward for policymakers, essentially. Like, 
very much what I said before. It's it's the idea that it's, it's refining this tool in order to use it so that we can start to, instead of having to go to every single sample site and every single place where we think these things are, we can produce a model that accurately reflects the distribution of these particular vulnerable marine environments and then protect them and offer that advice to like council boards and advisory policies and stuff to try and get these areas, not only people more aware that they exist, but also the distribution of them so that we can begin to protect these environments, which is pretty essential. Very cool. <laughs> In terms of my own research that I'm doing now on my placement is sponges in the Faroe Shetland Channel. The Faroe Shetland Channel is um, a big trough north of Scotland in between Faroe and Shetland, the islands, and it's incredibly unique in terms of its bathymetry. It's ridiculously cool. You've got incredibly warm water sitting on top of incredibly warm co cold water. Sorry, there's like a seven degree difference, if not more, between the two water bodies. So they don't really mix very much. They just kind of sit on top of each other. There's one's flowing north and one's flowing south. One's Nordic overseas floor and one is um, North Atlantic Drift. So, and then because of these two really extreme water bodies sitting on top of each other, there's an incredibly distinct thermocline within the water. And um, this particular event's called internal waves, where this thermocline uh, raises and then lowers again, and raises and lowers essentially, with waves that then break onto the like sides of the bank of the trough. And when these internal waves break, they resuspend sediment, so they cause a lot of turbulence within the water column. Loads of sediment is then stirred up and thrown back into the water column. And the idea of um, the resuspension of sediment is that when that sediment is resuspended, it, it then either flows downstream of the main resuspension event or is thrown out into the water column and sinks. So it's essentially like really concentrated marine, like organic particulate, then raining down on an area a little bit deeper than where the, the, where the internal uh, wave is hitting the shell. So what you end up with there is you end up with these gigantic aggregations of sponges, like in particular a type of sponge, uh, this type of aggregation of sponges called Oscar, which are these massive demo sponges that are, well, it's incredible, they're massive in the fields, again, like the Veronema, except for more dense. And the, it, it, the way that they're aggregated is, it, Everyone within the literature talks about it as a fact. So they're, they're, they essentially say this observation is obviously due to the effects of internal waves. But there is no concrete data for that. There, there, there's no data that statistically reflects the association between internal waves and the sponge aggregations, especially the ones. So my current work is analyzing these images in order to produce a data set that can be statistically analyzed. So that we can say, yes, we have a statistical like, result that shows that there is an association between these things. So instead of just people being like, yeah, okay, everybody says this, this thing is associated with this thing, and having no real scientific evidence in order to say so, no real kind of like numerical backing for what they're saying, and instead of just kind of running on the association that if everybody says this, it's right, you have concrete evidence, as it were, so you know that these things are, well, not know, but have better evidence so that, like, say so. So future development of this project, obviously concrete evidence. And then, again, with all of this work, like something that I personally am incredibly passionate about is engaging public and people that don't know stuff about these environments. Because I mean, the amount of people that are obsessed with space, like that's really well publicized. But the deep sea, not so much. I mean, you've got the Okeanos Explorer and stuff. But the more people that you can get involved with this kind of thing, be like, literally off the north coast of Scotland, what do you think there is? There's rocks? No, there's these huge, great big, gigantic aggregations of sponges, which are ridiculously biodiverse and rich. Like, they're not found in that kind of association like that level in many places in the world, they're, they're, they're much like rainforests. They're, they're not something you can just kind of trawl the hell out of and like completely ignore the existence of, because they are important. I mean, I mean, that's just all the work that I've been doing. In terms of my place in here itself, uh, the amount of value that I have for the work, not only the work that I'm doing, but what I've been able to engage with has just been I wouldn't have been able to get this through any other method. I mean, you begin to understand the work that goes into the science. It's not just, oh, somebody's published a paper. It's hours and hours and hours of painstaking analysis <laughs> and setbacks and realizing that you've done one calculation wrong that you've just spent four hours fixing. But understanding that now, I mean, gives me the opportunity to say, okay, maybe this isn't for me. I mean, that's not what I'm saying, definitely not. <laughs> but I mean, it, it could give me the opportunity to say, okay, this is work that I physically can't keep up with, but it, you need to have a real passion about what you're doing, essentially. And the understanding of that has really kind of driven more and more interest and more and more input for me to put into my work. Because, I mean, this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. 
And up to this point, I didn't, in all honesty, I didn't realize how much work it was gonna be. I really didn't, I really underestimated it. And I feel like a lot of people do that until, you can tell them as much as you want how hard it is, but unless they've actually experienced it, they have absolutely no idea. Like, and I'm not even doing hard stuff yet. <laughs> So, I mean, it's, it's the application of knowledge that I've learned on my degree program. Instead of just being able to go, oh, yes, Geodeo is a species of demo stuff. I, I know about the specific habitat, I know where it lives. I have to understand these things in order to understand the research that I'm doing. Like, it's applying what you know and how you learn, essentially, to real life situations. Like, beginning to build up this idea and understanding of essentially science as a way, instead of just being taught it and regurgitating what you're being told. Um, professional responsibilities and tasks. Not something that you get on a degree program usually, but being in placement, you get told, oh, okay, here is 500,000 pounds worth of cruise footage, like, don't lose it. And being given that responsibility, not only is really valuable for me because I understand the responsibility that's on my shoulders with this kind of work, but also it's, it's a working environment. I mean, up to this point, the jobs that I've had have been really low key kind of, no, no brain engagement, no, no role involved, just kind of do this one thing, there's no risk here. Whereas this kind of stuff, if I mess up, that will not only reflect me badly, but it will reflect my team badly, it will reflect my entire area badly, it will reflect the work that I'm doing badly, and that's, it's something you have to be always conscious about. It's not something that I was turned on about before, because I could hand in a piece of work in my undergraduate studies, and yeah, I'd get a first one, but I'd do this crap. Like, there'd the, the elements of that that just weren't good. Like, and I knew they weren't good, but they didn't care about it. Whereas this stuff, like the rigorous kind of testing of myself and my own work, just kind of going over it again and again and again, making sure that I've got things right, making sure I've got things nailed. So, I mean, it's not something that I've had up to this point in placement given me. And personal development and career development. I mean, who else as an undergraduate can say they went on a cruise? Who else can have this kind of fit? Or the knowledge that I do, or the application of the kind of knowledge that I've had in order to produce research materials? Not many people. I can tell you that now, not many people. And placement is, I, I honestly believe, the only way that I possibly could have got that before having, I don't know, like a PhD or proper experience within the field. Skill development and available through teaching, exactly. Like, you can't get these skills through teaching. As, as, as fantastic as the degree programs are, and as the phenomenal amount I've learned, there are particular skills that you can only learn by doing it yourself. And that's just the way it is. And having this opportunity is enabling me to do so. So, I mean, that's. Pretty much kind of a summary of why I feel like it's so important to me. Uh, a little video on all of the highlights of the cruise. Well, oh, it's not really highlights, it's just kind of what's not fun. Please play, please. This is just kind of like some of the, well, this was done at half 11 o'clock last night, so it's not the highlights, but it's the highlights I had on my computer in a particular file. <laughs> So this is um, this was thought to be several thousand years old. This is like the biggest piece of kind of imagery that we put out about the cruise because it, it was incredible. We went up to this thing. It's like what in excess of two meters tall. It was just chilling. It was just, okay, fine. You're thousands of years old. People don't know you're here, and people obsess over stuff that's like I don't know, thousand year old tree. Good deal. Whereas a coal that's four thousand years old, it's just kind of I've never seen these things before. It's incredible. And this was one dive where within like. 30 seconds of each other, we saw two deep sea sharks and a chimera. And it was just like, okay, well, Alasma breaks are kind of my thing alongside like the chinoderms, so that's ridiculously cool. And just seeing these organisms in their natural habitat, like not kind of, I don't know, in, in a textbook or, or, or as an image, like being there and having this ROV in the water and watching these things just kind of like hang in the water column and do their thing, it's just, oh, it's awesome. Really what does that say? That's chimera. I don't know what it's like. Okay. 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 It's not baby, is it? It's not very it's big. Not it might be a teenager. Yeah. Yeah. It's like 10 centimeters. <laughs> There's a lot more um, baby chimeras associated with the sponge application, which is really strange because as we were going over the sponge regulations, you would just see an excess of four or five baby chimeras just shooting about. And it's just like, okay, cool. Yeah. This was very good. <laughs> this was. Um, Dumbo. Dumbo octopus. So, and then it was like, it pulled the ROV back, turn, turn. So the ROV had stopped the transect essentially and just turned to see this octopus because they were almost just like, that's so cool. <laughs> that's amazing, that was. There was a couple of these that we saw, but this one was probably the most impressive one. And then there was this guy, which is a black scabber fish. 
and they're usually pelagic, so they hang in the pelagic, never touch the bottom. So you can imagine what a shock it is when <laughs> it touches the bottom and it's not doesn't really know what to do, as it were. Just kind of freaks out a bit. It, it, it just this kind of ecological niche, as it were, where an organism spends all of its life like this. Why? Yeah, it's really, really cool. Like it was, it was an enormous fish. And then this just is another one of those massive antitheria black holes. Like it was, it, it's huge. Like the, the, these things, they're taller than I am, and people don't know that they're there. And that, uh, I mean, I can understand why to do with the sampling and how difficult it is to get this imagery and stuff. But that is, there are these organisms that are thousands of years old and much more impressive in terms of my opinion, like the rainforest and stuff. You just have no idea that they're there. Absolutely no idea. And going down there and seeing these things that no human being has seen before, that have been there since, like to quote Carrie's video, since before Stonehenge, some of them. And it's just, it's, it, it's not something that I think many people can have the opportunity to be able to say they've seen before. But yeah, it's soft for a reason. It's black hole, so I honestly have no idea. Is it soft for a reason? No, it's, yeah. it's not as. It's got I mean, black it's hair. Good. So. It's not. Yeah, but it's it's not a stony core. No, it's not. Well, it's not stony. Yeah. But yeah, it does have a. It's really oh. cool. Wow. Yeah, it's incredible. And like oh, the two dots. Oh, they are yeah. hexagonal. Yeah. Oh. Not hexagonal. I mean hexagonal. Hexacoral. 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 Yeah, I mean the if I know God, I've gone there, the two dots um, are ten oh, yeah. centimeters apart. So each one of those single strands is like 25, 30 centimeters long. One of those strands, and then you can kind of see the scale of the yeah, organism yeah. itself. So. Can I ask a very naive question about these sort of Yes, of course. <laughs> I know nothing about these sort of things, but um, so one of the things that struck me is you were talking about the crews and. Yeah. The, the aim is to identify if what's evaluated if the predicted model is accurately predicts where these sort of habitats yes. are found, right? How do you know though like, why so if you go to a, a shallow sea hole, usually the sponge is sort of integrated in so we move the corals and mm -hmm. it together. Why why do you get the separation or aggregation of these sponges but you know coral ribbon? Within the coral reefs, there's a lot of sponges as well, a lot of sponges. But specifically Ferronema, um, from what I've read and what other people have told me, they occupy the same kind of niche, but the sponges, um, they're a lot deeper than the Lafino coral reefs. The Lafino coral reefs occupy about, I think, don't quote me on it, but I think it's between 500 and about 600 to 700 meters deep, whereas the Ferronema aggregations are like 1,000, 1,100 meters deep. There's a fa fairly large gap between the two. And the areas that you find them are slightly different, but the, the, the coral reefs themselves do have a lot of sponges in them, a lot. So you get species like Africalistes and um, other sponges. Like, there, there's a lot. Like, you look at these coral reefs and they're everywhere, just not that specific type of sponge. I mean, yeah, I was just sure because I thought from that that they were entirely separate. Yeah. Well, the two environments are like, you won't, uh, I don't know if you can. I, we didn't see any where there was Ferronema in the Lafida reefs or Lafida in the Ferronema reefs. But I think it's more like a depth thing as opposed to. Um, yeah, that's cool. Anyone else questions? Yeah, there's a question. So, you've done mm. spectacular work. Yeah, that's pretty cool, isn't um, it? How, is there anyone else who's doing this kind of thing in your year? No. Like, <laughs> did you just... Did you just <laughs>